Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering GI, and to be more specific, I'm going to be going over inflammatory bowel disease and covering the difference between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video, subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already, and pressing that red notification bell so you'll be notified every single time a new video is released. Don't forget, I am now offering Next Generation NCLEX reviews, one-on-one -on -one tutoring and consultation se sessions. You can also get audio lessons all on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. All right, guys, without any further ado, let's get started. Take a look. It says inflammatory bowel disease. This is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the GI tract. It's characterized by uh, remission inters interfs, you guys, you know, I can't speak interspersed with periods of exacerbation. So what happens is sometimes the patient will be much better than others. So this is a chronic condition. This is something that's ongoing. There is no cure, but there are times that the patient's going to have exacerbations where it's worth when it's worse and there's much more inflammation of the GI tract and then periods of uh, remission when it's much better and the inflammation isn't as bad. Again, there's no cure. Let's take a look. There's no cure. And irritable bowel disease, this is going to be classified as either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis fall under the umbrella of irritable bowel disease. Now, let's talk about the, uh, some differences. When we're talking about ulcerative colitis, you need to understand that that inflammation, the problem that's happening is usually limited to the colon. So when you think of ulcerative colitis, I want you to think of the colon, okay? Crohn's disease, that can involve any segment of the GI tract going from the mouth to um, the anus. Many people with irritable, irritable bowel disease, remember IBD is both Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Many people with IBD have family members with this disorder. Etiology and patho, it says auto, uh, IBD is an autoimmune disease. Let's stop right there. What does that mean when it says it's autoimmune? The body's attacking itself. The problem's coming from within, okay? IBD is an autoimmune disease involving an immune reaction. By the way, that immune reaction we're talking about is that inflammation. It involves an immune reaction to a person's own intestinal tract. And that's why it's autoimmune. The body's doing this to itself. So some agent or a combination of agents will trigger an overreactive, inappropriate immune response. What does this result in? Inflammation. This is the problem in both of this, these disorders, inflammation that causes tissue destruction. Let's look at vi environmental factors. Environmental factors, diet, exposure to air pollution, stress, smoking. All of these um, can change the environment of the bowel and um, the um, normal flora, and it can uh, be a trigger for the inflammatory reaction that's happening in IBD. Look over here. It says high dietary intake of total fats, polyunsaturated fatty acid, omega-6 omega fatty acids, and meat is associated with increased risk of IBD. Professor D, do I have to know these risk factors? Absolutely. High fiber and fruit intake is associated with decreased risk of Crohn's, where high vegetable intake is associated with decreased risk of ulcerative colitis. And guys, that kind of makes sense because fruits, vegetables are high in what? Fiber. So all of that crap that's sitting on the inner lining of the GI tract is causing this inflammatory reaction. When fiber is there, what does fiber do? It pulls all that crap out. So when the patient has a bowel movement, it comes out in the stool. So it makes sense that it will decrease the risk factors. Let's keep going. Oral contraceptives and NSAIDs make Crohn's worse. You need to know that. Genetic link, irritable bowel disease occurs more frequently in family members of people with irritable bowel disease. This is the second time we're seeing this. So don't you think that's important? The um, Author of this text is not letting you know that um, people with genetic links are at high risk. They're not saying the same thing two, three times just for their health. They're saying it because most likely you're going to see that as a test question. That's important to know. Now, let's go over the pattern of inflammation.
Now, remember how when we talked about ulcerative colitis, that inflammation is mainly in the colon? Take a look. So here's ulcerative colitis. Look at the colon. This is where you see the inflammation, where remember when we talked about ulcerative colitis, it could be anywhere from the mouth to the anus. And usually it happens sporadically. And if you take a look here, look at where you're seeing those red. Don't you see it's happening sporadically? Absolutely. So the pattern of inflammation in ulcerative colitis versus Crohn's disease, it says Crohn's disease can occur anywhere in the GI tract from the mouth to the anus. We've seen that already, but most commonly we're going to see it in the distal ileum and the proximal colon. Segments of normal bowel can occur between disease portions, and those are what's known as your skip lesions. And so what happens, I want to go back so you guys can have a visual, right? Inflammation normal, inflammation normal, inflammation normal, inflammation normal. So that's what's known as the skip lesions because they'll skip certain parts. The inflammation in Crohn's disease involves all layers of the bowel. That's important for you to know. So in Crohn's disease, not only can it happen anywhere in the GI tract, you have inflammation, normal, inflammation, normal, inflammation, normal. When it comes to the layers, it can happen in all layers. Let's keep going. In active Crohn's disease, fistulas are common. Where? Again, in all layers. Ulcerative colitis, remember colitis, where it's main, that inflammation is mainly in the colon. And ulcerative colitis, it usually starts in the rectum and it moves in a continual fashion towards the cecum. Ulcerative colitis is a disease of the colon and rectum. As you can see here, guys, the colon and rectum. The inflammation and ulcerations occur in the mucosa layer, the innermost layer of the bowel. Let's stop right there. There's another big difference. When we were talking about ulcerative colitis, there were skip lesions because you'd had inflammation normal, inflammation normal, inflammation normal. Not only that, it was happening everywhere or has the potential to happen everywhere from the mouth to the anus. And on top of that, that inflammation would be in all layers. But when we talk about ulcerative colitis, where that inflammation is in the colon, in the rectum, look at what it says. It says the inflammation does not extend through all bowel layers, but in Crohn's disease, it does. So we're already seeing a whole bunch of difference, differences between our Crohn's and our ulcerative colitis. Let's keep going. Clinical manifestations. It says, although the manifestations of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are similar, they both have diarrhea. By the way, guys, we're going to be concerned about what? Fluid electrolytes. Base comes out the butt. What else are we concerned about when it comes to diarrhea? Dehydration. What else do they have in common? Weight loss, abdominal pain, fever, fatigue. There are lots of similarities, but there are also many differences that you have to know as well. If the small intestines involved, Weight loss occurs from inflammation of the small intestines causing causing malabsorption because remember that absorption that's what happens where in the small intestine. Now in ulcerative colitis, we're right here in ulcerative colitis, the primary manifestations that you're going to see, and this is key, bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain. Before we get to the complications, I want to go back to the clinical manifestations and just kind of have a compare and contrast. Everything you see that I have highlighted, underlined, or put a star next to, I suggest you know, because most likely you're going to see it as a test question. You need to know this. All right. Let's look at the difference, a comparison of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. So as far as uh, the characteristics with ulcerative colitis, um, this is uh, rare as far as the weight loss. You really won't see weight loss as much as you'll see in Crohn's. Pathologically, location, when it comes to ulcerative colitis, remember it's ascending, it travels up usually starts at the rectum and it'll travel up to the colon. Remember, ulcerative colitis will go up to the colon. It spreads in a, look at this, continuous pattern. 
not skip lesions. Remember how we see skip lesions in ulcer in uh, Crohn's? We see inflammation normal, inflammation normal, inflammation normal. Nope. In ulcerative colitis, we'll see a continuous pattern. So that's a big difference because if we look over here in Crohn's, remember it occurs anywhere instead of just a rectum in the colon, it can happen anywhere. The most uh, frequent side is the distal ilium and healthy tissue is interspersed, interspersed no, I can't pronounce, interspersed with areas of inflammation. So be in, inflammation normal, inflammation normal, inflammation normal. That is what's known as your skip lesions. When you see skip lesions, I want you to think of Crohn's disease. Let's keep going. Let's go back to uh, ulcerative colitis. The depth of involvement, remember with ulcerative colitis, only the inner layer is involved, right? But when we take a look at Crohn's, all the layers are affected. That is a huge difference that you have to be aware of. So I suggest you take a minute and just pause and look at all of the differences. Not only what I highlight and underline, because I don't write your exams, but look at everything so you can have a good idea of the differences between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. But again, what I put a star next to highlighted or underlined, those are the most important differences that you know, you'd be questioned most often on exams. All right, let's talk about complications. It says GI tract complications include hemorrhage, strictures, perforation with possible peritonitis, by the way, that's medical emergency, abscesses, fistulas, uh, CDI, colonic dilation, your toxic megacolon. Patients with toxic megacolon are at risk for perforation again. Perforation is a medical emergency. That patient has perforation. If they don't get to um, OR and get surgery soon, it's not a question of if, it's when. They absolutely will die. Why? Because you have fecal matter in what's supposed to be um, a sterile environment. So perforation is one of the biggest concerns as far as complications, okay? So anyway, patients with toxic megacolon are at risk for perforation and they may need emergency colectomy. Toxic megacolon, we see this more often with ulcerative colitis. Perennial abscess and fistulas occur up to a third of patients that have Crohn's. Uh, CDI increases in uh, frequency and, and severity of patients that have both, which is your irritable bowel disease. If the patient's is bleed, if the patient's bleeding out, we're going to be concerned about anemia because obviously, if they're bleeding out, what's down? Hem um, hematocrit, hemoglobin, RBCs. Let's keep going. Patients with a history of IBD have increased risk for colon cancer. This is huge. NCLEX asks about this often, or they have asked about this often. I don't know about this new NCLEX, we'll see, but you definitely need to know the patients that have history of IBD are going to be at increased risk for colon cancer. Those with Crohn's disease are at increased risk for small intestinal cancer. Cancer screening at regular intervals is important in persons with irritable bowel disorder. Let's look at interprofessional care. More specifically, I'm going down to management. High calorie, why? You need energy to fight infection. High vitamin, high protein. Remember, protein is not only good for muscles, it's also good for what? Fighting infection, wound healing. High protein, a low residue, lactose-free if the patient's lactose intolerant diet. Drug therapy, amino salicylates, antimicrobial, corticosteroids, corticosteroids and um what's the other drug class? Immunosuppressants. Those are huge in this kind of disorder because of the inflammation that's happening. All right. Physical and emotional rest. You want to teach that patient to stay away from stressful environments and stressful people. Again, if you take a look at this box, that goes over drug therapy. Again, your amino salicylates, antimicrobials, cortical steroids, immunosuppressants, and biological targeted therapy. Why do you think we just saw this in a table and now we're seeing it in another table on the very next page because it's important to know. You need to know the type of treatment that's available for um, IBD. Medications containing 5-amino salicylic acid remains a mainstay. That means your cornerstone in achieving and maintaining remission and preventing flare-ups. So that is gonna be the cornerstone medications for IBD, okay? 
your amino solicit amino salicylic acid. They include here are the drugs: sulfasalazine, sulfa-free drugs, amino salicylates are more effective for ulcerative colitis. Many people cannot tolerate the side effects of sulfasalazine, headaches, nausea, fatigue occur at higher doses. In men, long-term sulfasalazine treatment may cause abnormal sperm production. You have to warn them about this, leading to infertility. These effects are reversible if sulfasalazine is discontinued. So important things to know about sulfasalazine is that it can cause yellowish discoloration of the skin and urine and avoid exposure to sunlight and UV light until photosensitivity has been determined. Again, what other medications do you expect the patient to be um, on? Corticosteroids. What do we know about corticosteroids? They are great for decreasing inflammation, but you better be concerned about these four things. Off the bat, corticosteroids, you're going to be concerned about stomach ulcers because they're very hard on the stomach. The patient needs to take it with food. You're going to be concerned about osteoporosis because they tend to make the bones porous. So you're going to be concerned about fractures. You're going to be concerned about infection because remember, it decreases inflammation, masks no signs and symptoms of infection. So you better be looking at the temperature. You better be looking at the WBCs. You better be looking for signs and symptoms of infection much, much more closely. And the fourth thing you need to be concerned about is hyperglycemia. If we know anything about steroids, we know that increases the patient's blood sugar. So imagine a patient who has to take this medication, but they're diabetic. You better be taking their glucose much more often. immunosuppressive agents. Let's talk about methotrexate, which is a type of immunosuppressive agent, okay? Methotrexate is most useful in patients with Crohn's disease who cannot stop corticosteroid use without a flare-up or in whom other medications have not been effective. So the methotrexate, guys, that is not our first choice. But if we have a patient that has Crohn's, they you know, the minute they stop the steroid, they have a flare-up or they just can't take any of the other medications, this is a good option for them. You're going to advise women of childbearing age to avoid pregnancy because this medication can cause birth defects and even fetal death. Currently, there are six biological and target uh, medications for our anti-tumor necrosis factor agents, and they give you the list of meds. You guys can take a look at them. I'm not even going to try to pronounce them. You see them. Hold on. Let me focus on it for you. All right. If the patient had to have a surgery, they now have to have a colostomy or they had to have a portion of um, their GI tract removed. You need to know about the post-op care, the important things to know. So post-operative care after surgical procedures for IBD is similar to that described in the general nursing care plan for a post-op patient. Now, let me, before I go any further, let me say this, any patient that has had an invasive procedure, whether it's this or anything else, you better be concerned about bleeding. You better be concerned about hemorrhage and you better be concerned about that patient developing a clot or even a pulmonary embolism. Let's keep going. Immediately after surgery, ileostomy output initially can be as high as 1,500 to 1,800 milliliters in that first 24 hours. You're going to observe the patient for signs of fluid electrolyte imbalance. You're going to observe them for hemorrhage, abdominal abscess, a small bowel obstruction, which means you're going to be doing what? You're going to be listening to them for bowel sounds. You're going to be assessing them for dehydration and other related complications. You're going to have the patient start Kegel exercises about four weeks after they've had surgery because you want to help them strengthen their abdominal floor and sphincter muscles. Perianal skin care is important to protect the epidermis from mucoid drainage and maceration. You're going to instruct the patient to gently clean the skin with a mild cleanser, rinse well, and dry thoroughly. A moisture barrier ointment and perineal pad may be used. Let's talk about nutrition. It is muy importante. It is essential that people with IBD eat a balanced, healthy diet with enough calories, protein, and nutrients. Let's go down here. Look what it says. Patients may reduce food intake in an effort to reduce the diarrhea. Inflammatory mediators reduce appetite. Bloody diarrhea can lead to, you know, iron deficiency anemia, and that can require treatment with supplemental uh, iron. 
as you know, if a patient has to take supplemental iron, you know what to teach them. You're going to teach them to take it in the morning before they have anything to eat because they got to take it on an empty stomach. You're going to teach them to take it with ascorbic acid, something like uh, um, orange juice, because the patient needs that vitamin C in order to absorb the iron. You're going to teach them to drink plenty of fluids because iron is very constipating. You're going to warn them that iron can change the color of the stool so they don't freak out when they see their stool that that very dark color. So all of that teaching that goes with iron, you know what it is. Make sure you teach the patient, all right? Uh, parental or IV iron may be needed in patients who cannot tolerate oral iron or if anemia is severe. You know if you're giving that iron intramuscularly, you're going to give it via a z track method. Patients uh, receiving sulfasalazine should receive folic acid daily. Remember, folic acid is very important for what? CNS. Those receiving corticosteroids are prone to osteoporosis, I told you, and need calcium supplements. Let's talk about calcium supplements for a minute. While that patient's taking su calcium supplements, they need vitamin D because guess what you need to absorb calcium? Vitamin D. Vitamin D deficiency um requiring supplemental supplementation is common. During an acute exacerbation, patients with IBD may not be able to tolerate a regular diet. This is during the times of exacerbation. Liquid enteral feedings are preferred over parental nutrition because atrophy of the gut and bacterial overgrowth can occur. Enteral, guys, make sure you know the difference, please, between parental and enteral, okay? So if something is parental, it's bypassing the GI tract, something like IV. If something is enteral, it's going via the GI tract. So anyway, enteral nutrition is high in calories and nutrients, lactose-free, and it's easily absorbed. Enteral feedings help achieve remission and improve nutritional status. So that's what we're going to try for first. right here. Because many patients with IBD are lactose intolerant, avoiding milk and milk products is going to improve the symptoms. Lactose intolerant patients, excuse me, they can use yogurt as a substitute. Now I have this highlighted in a different color. This is important to note. High fat foods, cold foods, high fiber foods, such as cereal with bran, um, nuts, raw fruits with peels may all trigger diarrhea. So be very careful with that. Again, high fat foods, cold foods, high, high fiber foods, such as cereal with bran, nuts, raw fruits, and peels, all can trigger diarrhea. More nursing interventions. You're gonna monitor the INO, monitor the number and appearance of stools. Assess for the presence of blood in stools and emesis. You're going to administer IV fluids as ordered, give analgesics as ordered. You're going to give anti-inflammatory medications as ordered. You're going to monitor serum and electrolytes because remember, they're going to lose serum and electrolytes through that stool, the CBC. You want to make sure the patient does not, they're not become anemic. You're going to be looking at the vital signs. You want to make sure you do not see blood pressure go down, heart rate go up, breathing go up, urine output go down. Those are signs and symptoms of what? Hemorrhaging. That patient may be bleeding out somewhere. So you better be paying attention to not only the vital signs, but you need to be able to track it. What's going up? What's going down? You're going to teach a patient to change position slowly. You see safety precautions until the diarrhea is controlled, you need to help that patient stay clean, dry, and free of odor. Dubacaine, witch hazel, sits baths, and other soothing compress compresses or ointments may reduce irritation and discomfort of the anus for in the area. Um, you're going to do daily weights. Th th let me tell you why daily weights is important. The number one way that you can measure fluid status, how much so the patient's losing is daily weights. It's not skin turgor. It's not INO. It's daily weights. You're going to have the pain. You're going to weigh the patient daily in the morning before they eat. Same type of clothes, same type of scale. Okay. Um, IBD is a chronic illness. You're going to assist the patient in accepting the chronicity of IBD and learning strategies to cope. You're going to teach them the importance of rest and diet. 
perianal care, the drug action and side effects to watch out for, and adverse uh, um, uh, reactions to report, the symptoms of recurrence of the disease, when to seek medical care, ways to reduce stress. They have to stay away from stressful environments and stressful people. What else is important? They need to stop smoking. Smoking is a trigger, okay? And it, it causes severity of the disorder. You need to teach them the importance of rest. Drugs such as NSAIDs, Digitalis, uh, Sumatriptan, Vasopressin, estrogen, allopurinol, they've all been associated with the development of colitis in the geriatric patient. Colitis can also be secondary to ischemic bowel disease related to atherosclerosis and heart failure. So guys, in a nutshell, that is your biggest difference between your Crohn's, your ulcerative colitis, the clinical manifestations, and most importantly, your nursing intervention, because a lot that's where a lot of your test questions are going to come from, nursing intervention. So I hope you guys found this video to be helpful. Please let me know what you thought about this video in the comment section. Let me know what you'd like for me to teach you about next. And the format, do you want it in a Kahoot? Do you want it in a lecture like I'm doing right now? Do you want it in a question answer format like the you know what videos I make on Sundays, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time? Let me know in the comment section. Don't forget guys, almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics on my social media platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video. You guys will catch me on the next video.